Let's pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Rose and flows of angels' hair, and ice cream castles in the air, and feather canyons everywhere. I've looked at clouds that way. But now they only block the sun, they rain and snow on everyone. So many things I would have done, but clouds got in my way. I've looked at clouds from both sides now, from up and down and still somehow, it's cloud illusions, I recall. I really don't know clouds at all. Moons and Junes and Ferris wheels, the dizzy dancing way you feel, as every fairy tale comes real, I've looked at love that way. But now it's just another show. You leave them laughing when you go, and if you care, don't let them know. Don't give yourself away. I've looked at love from both sides now, from give and take, and still somehow, it's love's illusions I recall. I really don't know love at all. At first glance, we might think these lyrics by Joni Mitchell are just about how we remember the good times. We might think this song is just about how we go through ups and downs in life, but ultimately the pain subsides, time heals all wounds and happiness remains. And that's part of the song for sure. But in the last two lines of the refrain, Mitchell invites us to go much deeper. She uses the word illusions in an unusual way. Cloud illusions, love's illusions. And we may hear that at first as negative, a negative word. We might think that by calling the good times illusions, she's saying that we are being fooled by them, that they're just illusions, that they aren't real, that we're just wearing rose-colored glasses. But I suggest that she is using that word more from the perspective of the magician than the audience. You see, a magician takes our perceptions of reality, what we think we know, and then with artistry and creativity, reflects them back to us as something new and wondrous, something we never thought possible. And I believe Mitchell is reminding us that when we look at clouds and see angels' hair, we're bringing ourselves into a relationship with the clouds and we are creating something new. We are using our imaginations to shape and change reality. We are using our creativity to add something to life. We envision what could be and we end up creating what is. So it is these illusions, it is reality combined with our imagination, combined with our yearning for something more that we recall in the end. These are the times that last, that are more real than simple quote, objective reality. And if we live our lives with imagination, with vision, with creativity, if we act as if our visions of what seem impossible are in fact coming true through the visioning, we begin to create this new reality for ourselves and for others. Greg Baum was a Catholic priest, sociologist, and theologian. He was a theological advisor for Vatican II and influenced by liberation theology. And he put it this way, while in classical Catholic theology, it was supposed that faith resides in the intelligence. It is more realistic to say that faith resides in the imagination. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann, author of the classic, The Prophetic Imagination, writes this, poetic imagination is the last way left to challenge and conflict dominant reality. Poetic imagination is the last way left to challenge and conflict dominant reality. And so when the early Christians found an empty tomb where the dead body of Jesus had been laid, and when they started to experience visions of the risen Christ and share those vision with others, they really weren't just testifying to some single event that happened so long ago. They were beginning to use the prophetic imagination Jesus had taught them. They were beginning to use the prophetic imagination Jesus practiced throughout his life. 
They were boldly and faithfully challenging the dominant reality. They were bringing their imaginations into their experience of the empty tomb. And inspired by Christ, they began to create a new world. Now, some of you might be thinking, Pastor Tom is just saying the resurrection is in our imaginations. Don't tweet that, okay? <laughs> Headline, local pastor denies resurrection on Easter Sunday. <laughs> now, I'm not saying it's just in their imaginations, but I am saying it's in their imaginations. I would just take out the word just from that summary. To say it's just their imaginations is to minimize the centrality of imaginations in our faith. Because without imagination, how do we even know what we're putting our faith in? Without imagination, how do we have a relationship with an invisible God? Without imagination, how, what could, without a, imagination, without a vision of what could be, how are we going to strive for this beloved community to which we are called? To say the resurrection was just in the disciples' imagination is to forget that imagination and vision and faith are all part of the same family. They're all part of the same family of ways we transform this life into what God is calling the world to be. So it was not just their imaginations, it was not only their imaginations, but as they told the stories of the risen Christ, as they shared their real experience of the risen Christ, they began to, to loose the risen Christ on the world. They began to change the way people believed and about what they believed was possible. They opened doors for people to know Christ, not just as somebody who had died, but as a spirit, a life force, a community that was still alive today. And didn't Jesus do the same thing? When Jesus walked this earth, he did so with this exact creative vision that challenged an oppressive dominant reality. As he walked the countryside of Judea, he did not see as the world sees. He did not see good and bad people, outcasts and sinners. He saw diverse and beautiful people gathered at a great banquet to be fed and rejoice together. And then that vision became meals with people who had never shared a table before. He did not see women and men. He saw human beings made in the image of God. And that empowered the women who followed him to challenge the dominant reality of patriarchy and become the first witnesses to his resurrection. The first to trust the reality of their vision. He did not see people as blind or deaf or mentally ill or physically disabled or lacking of something. He saw whole, whole people. And so he reminded them that they were created in the image of God too. When he rode into Jerusalem, when the crowds could only see a powerful military leader ready to exact vengeance on the Roman oppressor, he saw himself on a cross and he showed us how to disrupt the cycles of violence and vengeance forever. Now, it was not easy for him to live that way with such vision when the dominant reality was so dominant and his heart would be broken countless times because he held on to that vision. His body would be broken on a cross. The powerful would seem to triumph over his entire life as his disciples scattered in fear. And yet he continued to persistently and faithfully bring his imagination to the things we often define as unchangeable objective reality. He did this because he knew that if he brought love into every relationship, regardless of who society told him he could love, that it's love's illusions he would recall. If he saw whole people, living people, when society only saw broken, dying people, if he saw life when society only saw death, that it's life's illusions he would recall. He knew that when he treated the world as a beloved community, despite our every division that the powerful try to impose upon us all, it's the beloved illusions he would recall. He knew that if he refused to bow to an empire that was threatened by his vision, that it is, it's his power, his life, and his love that we would recall. Love creates the moments that last. Life creates the moments that last. Vision creates the moments that last. And this sad, pathetic thing we call objective reality 
isn't really life at all. Tears and fears and feeling proud to say I love you right out loud, dreams and schemes and circus crowds, I've looked at life that way. But now old friends are acting strange, they shake their heads, they say I've changed. Well, something's lost, but something's gained in living every day. I've looked at life from both sides now, from win and lose and still somehow. It's life's illusions, I recall. I really don't know life at all. When my, uh, when my 18 year old niece, Abby, was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. She chose a motto that she was going to live by and that she invited others to live by with her. She chose live a beautiful life. And from the time she was diagnosed, that's exactly what she did. As she went through intensive chemotherapy and radiation and all the pain and suffering involved, she chose to see beauty and she chose to create beauty. She loved tattoos. She loved the artwork that we put on our skin. She had tattoos representing her mother and father up here near her collarbone. And she got live a beautiful life tattooed on her arm, as well as her parents did the same and her aunties and uncles and cousin did the same right there. She and her family traveled and grew closer than they ever had. She started reaching out more to loved ones. She deepened her friendships. She fell in love. She fell in love with a young man who was by her side when she died. She shared her journey on social media, of course, a modern day evangelist for beauty. And what struck me most in all of that was the word that she chose, that she chose beauty as her highest value. She could have said, live a good life or a happy life, something more cliche, live your best life, live a grateful life. But she specifically chose beauty. And I'm sure she didn't know when she chose that word that some of the greatest spiritual thinkers agree with her. Mahatma Gandhi, of all people, said it simply, real beauty is my aim. The, eater, the leader of the Indian independence revolution who inspired millions of people said, real beauty is my aim. St. Francis of Assisi, even more simply said, God is beauty. Orthodox theologian Carolyn Gifford writes, in the Orthodox spiritual tradition, the ultimate moral question that we ask is the following, is what we are doing beautiful or not? Abby had probably never read any of that. She just knew intuitively that she needed to spend her time left creating beauty that bringing creativity and vision and imagination into the harsh objective reality that she had been given was the most real thing she could do. The beauty was more real than the cancer. And none of that made the sadness or the pain just go away. They were all mixed in there together, but you can believe that her commitment to see beauty changed her life and the lives of everyone who journeyed along with her and that we who she left behind are already remembering the beauty so much more. It's life's illusions, we recall. The resurrection of Christ is not a single event. It is only real if it literally objectively happened 2,000 years ago. Resurrection is the culmination of Jesus' life and ministry. Resurrection is the continuation of Jesus' life and ministry. It is his disciples finally getting it and beginning to unleash on the world the visions he demonstrated in the way he lived. And so today we experience the resurrection. Every time we look at someone as Christ did. Hello. Oh, come to me. <laughs> Holy Spirit. Okay, could you just stay there for a minute. That was beautiful. You see that? <laughs> we experience the resurrection every time 
we stop to look at a beautiful moth flying in the sanctuary. We experience resurrection every time we apply the vision of Christ to what we see, every time we treat people according to this resurrection vision. We experience the resurrection of Christ every time we see people who are dehumanized and degraded by this world, and we ex refuse to accept that characterization. And instead, we challenge that dominant reality by seeing every person as a child of God. That is the resurrection vision Christ taught. We experience the resurrection of Christ every time we use our imaginations to see a world of justice for all people. And we begin to create that world by how we treat everyone and how we stand up to those who keep creating so much injustice. That is the resurrection vision Christ taught. We experience the resurrection of Christ every time we use our imaginations to see a healed earth and we live our lives in ways that don't just sustain God's creation, but restore it. That's the resurrection vision Christ taught. We experience resurrection every time we see the powerful and the privileged of this world as just people, and we lovingly help them down from their pedestals. That's the resurrection vision that Christ taught. And on a very personal level, then, we see, we experience the resurrection of Christ every time we feel joy after a season of grief, because we see in our minds and in our hearts that the person we lost is still with us. It's the life we create from the reality we have been given that is most real. It's the life we create with imagination that is most real. It's the life we create through faith that is most real. It's the life we create through love that is most real. It's the beauty we create in this life that is most real. And without love and beauty and vision and imagination, we really don't know life at all. So friends, live with resurrection vision. Challenge the dominant reality. Imagine and create a world where every person is seen and treated as a child of God. Imagine and create the beloved community. Live a beautiful life. Because in the end, it's life's illusions we recall. Amen.